all of this is a huge earner for the exchequer. It's a huge industry from payroll to tax consulting, off payroll working, agencies, umbrella companies and beyond. So while ever there is employment, there will be employment taxation and law and payroll. There is, however, a need for simplification and streamlining. I think the future's bright for employment taxes. I think the future's bright for payroll. And I think what we need to do as professionals in those industries is to be as proactive and agile as we possibly can. Welcome to the Payroll Podcast, the show that explores the latest insights and innovations in the world of payroll. I'm Nick Day, founder of JGA Recruitment, a specialist global payroll search firm. I'm also a qualified executive coach and a recognized Reward 300 member. And my goal for this show is clear, is to bring you expert guests and payroll leaders who are driving this industry forward. From cutting edge technologies and trends to compliance, analytics, automation, leadership strategies, and more, we're gonna cover it all on this show to help you to deliver accurate and timely payrolls across your organizations. So let's join together in raising the strategic profile of payroll worldwide. Grab your coffee or your favorite beverage, and let's get started. Hello and welcome back to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO at JGA Recruitment Group, and we are specialist payroll recruiters. Today, I'm not going to ask you all to share the episode and review it because I've got an introduction that's going to blow away all of the introductions today. I'm welcoming Justine Riccamini, Head of Tax, Employment and Devolved Taxes at ICAST to the show. And this is going to be some introduction because you will not believe just how passionate and committed Justine is to the payroll industry. Because... Her role at the moment, well, it involves studying and analysing employment law, tax legislation, attending meetings with bodies including the HMRC, HM Treasury, BIS, DWP, Revenue Scotland, Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament and more. But she's also responsible for responding to consultation documents, for writing articles associated with payroll, taxation and legislation. And within her writing, if you're not familiar, you'll often find her critically analysing government policy and process. Now, if you're not familiar with Justine yet and you haven't met her on one of the many panels she's involved in, let me give you a little bit of a rundown of where you might come across Justine and her work. Well, she's currently responsible for running the Devolved Taxes and Employment Taxes Committees, which both report to ICAS, uh, ICAS Tax Board. She also sits on the Scottish Taxes Policy Forum and the West Yorkshire Women in Tax Steering Committee, and she was the policy lead at West Yorkshire CIPD Committee as well. Branch Chair for Scotland and Manchester IFA and an expert panellist for the AAT Payroll and Pensions Panel. She also co-chairs the Employment and Payroll uh, Group, the EPG, the National Minimum Wage Forum, the Employment Status and Intermediaries Forum, formerly known as the IR35 Forum, and the Construction Forum with an HMRC BEIS. And if you didn't know this already, she's also a board member for the Chartered Institute of Payroll Professionals, also known as the CIPP, where she works hard to try and make the Institute the best it can be for its members members and for the good of the payroll profession. And if perhaps you haven't met her on a committee, you may have read one of her articles because she's authored many articles for all the major payroll publications. She's even given evidence at Scottish Parliament and the House of Lords. And when she isn't working, she's also the proud founder of Litter Free SB, which is a locally based litter picking group in her small Pennines town. And I am going to put a link to that in the show notes for those of you that are interested in finding out more. Her motto is choosing kindness. I think that uh, absolutely shows with her commitment to the world of payroll and to the world of taxation and for raising the profile of these professions for everyone involved. So without further ado, it gives me huge pleasure to welcome someone so passionate about the industry, so committed to the industry. So without further ado, Justine, welcome to the Payroll Podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm very well, thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. Absolutely excited to have you here. I, I guess a, a question I love asking all my guests, but in particular, I'm really excited to ask this question to you. What does the word payroll mean to you? Payroll means hard work. It means commitment. It means um, coping with unusual and sometimes stressful situations, um, yeah. dealing with a crisis uh, calmly with a calm head on. And if you can do all of that and you'll make an excellent payroll professional, you've got a very good career in front of you. 
Fantastic. And I'd be, I imagine there'll be a lot of listeners nodding their heads like I am here. Absolutely couldn't agree more. It's a, it's a, it's a challenging profession, right? But you're involved on, on the employment tax side at the moment. Why is that such an important subject? So how do we relate that to the world of payroll for those that perhaps aren't so familiar? Well, I, people often hear me say, and they think I'm joking, but actually I'm really not. <laughs> I say that employment taxes rules the world um, because actually the term employment taxes covers a multitude of sins and, and it's often mistaken as being something simple and uncomplicated. Anybody who thinks that is uh, definitely labouring under something of a of a rather large misapprehension. People say employment taxes. Well, pff, that's just payroll, isn't it? Which really annoys me because, for one thing, as all payroll professionals know, payroll is far from simple, nor is it a backroom admin job, which is why the Chartered Institute of Payroll Professionals runs so many levels of qualification on the subject, sure. ranging from like entry level foundation and to postgraduate degree courses. Um, so, you know, in fact, employment taxes is a, is a collective term for a reason, because it caters for any and every aspect of the life cycle of an employment. Um, that could be from onboarding a new starter right through to life events such as apprenticeships and student contracts, immigration, emigration, Maternity, coping with illness and bereavement, moving to another office, another country, getting promoted or working less hours, working from home, working anywhere in the world, on the planet, as well as termination payments and retirement benefits. So there's a lot to it. So not only does employment tax cover all things payroll and related aspects such as earnings arrestments, student loans, parental leave, child care arrangements, etc., which are each catered for separately, by the way, uh, by pe separate pieces of legislation, which we all need to, to know and understand. Sure. But it also encompasses the em enormously important and, and, may I say, rather dangerous national minimum wage. But I'll speak about that a bit later on. Before we do this, I know there's, I'm probably going to ask you a little bit more about the PAYE element to this as well, but do you think, just when it comes to mind... But payroll then is ready for a a title change. Should we be thinking about in, including tax you know, employment you know, taxation into the world of payroll as a title, payroll and employee taxation manager, for example, or or do we just accept that it's in it, it it's part of of what payroll is? I think there's there's two there's two answers to that. Uh, first of all, I I personally believe that payroll isn't a business service. I believe it's a tax service um, okay. because there's so much in involved in it that relates to taxation and the, the underlying legislation. Um, coming with that, there is also uh, the consideration of a, of a thing which has been really important recently called the professional conduct in relation to taxation. Um, so if it's not a piece of legislation, it's actually a concept which um, is being championed, if you like, by several accountancy and taxation related institute bodies. And the the way in which that is going is it's leaning towards um, having certain standards in requirements for people who actually work in tax and deliver tax advice. So there's a big question at the moment hanging over whether payroll is actually a tax advisory service yeah. or whether it's a, a different kind of service. And if it is a tax advisory service, and if we think about payrolling benefits, then that's probably, uh, you know, something that we can relate to. Um, then if it is, it will be governed by PCRT, as it's known. So okay. there's a, a lot of different considerations there with that. So just it's just a way of trying to get it into my mind because it's it's evolving so quickly and everyone always yeah. asks where does it sit and what you know is it payroll and reward is it payroll and tax is it payroll now on its own so it's great to get your 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 yeah. thoughts on that and I know that uh, you were going to talk to me a little bit about PAY so I'll let you um come back to that but uh, yeah I'm just intrigued to see how how you sort of fit yeah that's great I mean I think you know payroll and reward and tax are to me an a, a inseparable cluster of of things. Um, mm -hmm. If you know about one, 
then ideally you should know about the other. Um, sure. And that's that's where I come from. I think education is a great thing and it's good to constantly be improving our knowledge and educating ourselves. So um, I guess sort of on the, on the pay as you earn side of things, um, let's not forget that pay as you earn is, is a withholding of income tax by employers on employment earnings. And it, it's covered by a whole load of different regulations, including pay as you earn regulations, income tax earnings and pensions act 2003, otherwise known as ITPA, national insurance contributions, which is the UK's equivalent of social security, of course. It's not technically a tax as such national insurance, but it is governed by the DWP under the Social Security Contributions and Benefits Act 1992. And in addition to that, there's all the legislation surrounding various types of benefits in kind, such as company cars, vans, fuel, private medical insurance, Christmas parties, etc. The benefits code, uh, as it's technically known, is, is dealt with under ITPA 2003 as well. So tied in with that, we've got different ways of taking employer-related benefits, such as salary sacrifice, which actually should really be called salary exchange because that's what it is. Sure. No yeah. no one or nothing is being sacrificed here, right? So That's um, a good point. And actually, yeah. it's something that's very much in the um, – <laughs> when, when I look at the social forums, this is still an element, salary sacrifice, which – Pale professionals still find confusing and uh, yeah. it's, it's a challenging element. Um, but it's, it's interesting you say that. Yeah, it, it is much more of a salary exchange. If I think about how I've used it for a you know, cycle to work or whatever, it's, that's exactly what it is. Yes, um, absolutely. I, I remember I was a tax inspector a long time ago and I used to visit people. And one of the questions on my questionnaire was, um, do you operate a salary sacrifice scheme? And if people had never heard of it, it, it you used to see raised eyebrows all over the place and people thinking sa salary sacrifice, who's sacrificing what, you know? And uh, and also if you're trying to get employees interested in the concept of sacrificing salary, perhaps to save a bit of national insurance on, you know, salary sacrifice for pension or something. Yeah. Sacrificing salary is not an entirely um, conducive way to get people on board. interested in the concept. No, absolutely <laughs> right. Salary exchange sounds... So do you, do you know, I know with your research, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you know what the origins of of where that, why it's called, what it is, why it's called yeah. salary sacrifice? I do, well, it's, a, it's a revenue term. It was okay. it was originally invented by what was the Inland Revenue, now HMRC, but goodness only knows who came up with that particular phrase. I think it's... Uh, it's a crazy phrase to use because it scares the living daylights out of people. I think we need an update. And I prefer salary exchange because you're basically exchanging salary yeah. for something in Yeah, that makes sense. So and people can not... understand that, can't they? You're, the yeah. thing, you're actually, if I'm going to go a cycle to work scheme, I understand that's a salary exchange. That makes total yeah. sense. Yeah, for totally. sure. Totally. You're not giving anything up. You're just swapping yeah. something for something. So that's okay. Um, so I guess, um, you know, there, there's... It's got more complicated along the along the years as well because now we've got optional remuneration to consider as well, and you know these things can reduce some tax and national insurance on the salary that's being exchanged for benefits. Yeah, subject of course to certain exemptions and reliefs, or in some cases help employees to get up to the next level of benefits up the scale, such as a better company car or family cover under a private medical insurance policy or something like that, you know, depending on your lifestyle choices. Does it does it cover anything else? So what about um, share schemes and, and, and expats, things like that? Does that, that also fall under the banner? Well, apart, you know, apart from what people can earn directly through their pay, um, employment taxes, the term, also covers you know, things like employment related securities, which is share schemes to, yep. to thee and me sort of thing, uh, which requires legal and tax expertise and expat taxes, which are also known as global mobility taxes, people moving around geographically in the world to do their jobs, usually for multinational organizations. And of course, now we've got hybrid working as well. And a lot of people decided to go and live in Spain and, yeah, and work yeah. from Spain using their laptop, which creates its own set of, of uh, little quirky difficulties. 
But none of any of the tax stuff that I've just rattled off can work on its own. It's joined at the hip with employment law and HR expertise as well. You can't do one without doing the other, really. So I personally find that being duly qualified in tax and HR gives me a broad perspective on both sides of the equation. And I'd recommend it to anybody, actually, just, you know, to, to get more qualifications and experience as on a, both sides of the fence. As a question there, then, because one of the common debates we have, well, actually, well, I want, before I ask the question, I, I'm going to say a huge well done for just explaining in great detail just how complex this industry is. For anyone outside looking in or listening to this who've wa- randomly discovered the payroll podcast and isn't in payroll, have just heard your explanation there, is going to go, wow, I had no idea just how complex the world of payroll, the world of taxation is. And I think you've, you've, you've articulated brilliantly there just why the, the it can't all be done by a system number one and why we need people involved why there's there's a whole uh, conceptual element to this as well with legislation changing which obviously is where your expertise comes in justine so you know thank you for that yeah. because i think it, you know, we, the industry needs and others that come into this industry need reminding just how complex it is and how challenging it is for the payroll professionals that are involved in this work and you mentioned that right at the start how hard payroll people work and how much of a challenging profession it can be What I'm really interested in, because you've got those two qualifications, we get lots of questions and debates about where payroll should sit. So you mentioned earlier, it's kind of part of a a, a broader tax element. Okay, it's great. But then we also have the debate, should it sit under finance? Should it sit under HR? And you've got that HR background as well. And you just mentioned there how it connects with with employment legislation. Yeah. Or should it be its own entity? And it's an ongoing debate. And I actually don't know, having been in this industry 20 years, what my personal view is. I think it could sit on its own, but it feeds into so many different things. We're seeing a big shift moving from finance to HR. Uh, used to be when I started this industry, probably 70% finance, 30 percent HR. It's much more 50-50 these days. But with someone with your background and, and dual qualifications and dual experience, what would your response be to that? I, I think that um, ideally speaking, a payroll should be uh, in the same room as HR, okay. if, if not necessarily the same department, but reporting to finance, et cetera. Okay. Uh, re- reporting to the, the REMCOM, reporting to the board, et cetera. Because I think that nowadays um, HR has become so much more important to every employer. Nobody wants to be taken to a tribunal. Yeah. And we have to watch every step that we take as employers to to make sure that people are saying and doing and behaving in the right way. And, you know, nobody's getting the business into trouble from an HR point of view. You do come across some horror stories, but for the most part, most people kind of behave relatively well um, and, uh, you know, don't punch each other's lights out at the Christmas party, for example. <laughs> sure. But, you know, the, it, it's. A, I think that nowadays the, there's a HR is a real growth industry and the the importance of getting it right has, has landed at, at the feet of employers. But I think, you know, if if all managing directors and CEOs could actually understand how complicated payroll, employment taxes, and HR as as a sort of conglomerate, as a collective, actually are, then, you know, they would take payroll an awful lot more seriously, sure. but tie it in. Because the, the a lot of the software nowadays is payroll with HR bolt-ons yeah, or yeah, HR yeah. with payroll bolt-ons. You know, it, it goes, kind of goes together like hand in glove a little bit. So... We also yeah. know it's very, very expensive if people get it wrong, right? Really yeah. expensive, especially it's it's not quite so bad. Well, I say that. I mean, it still costs thousands potentially if somebody's unfairly dismissed. But if somebody can claim discrimination in the courts and win, then it's expensive because mm. the damages are unlimited. So it, it can be very expensive, yeah. So, yeah, um, I mean, in terms of sort of, HR and employment legislation, I suppose there's one massive subject around that, and that's employment status. It's enormous. It's colossal. Something which puts fear into the heart of most employers because it's so expensive to get it wrong. And it's something that has to be decided upon before anybody puts pen to paper and signs a contract. So sadly, I'm not going to be looking at that Um uh, you know, at the, this time in any detail. But one thing that I would say is that 
employment status isn't covered by any kind of legislative provisions. It's based entirely on case law. So if you want to do employment status right, you must read constantly what's happening in the courts because things get out of date because one case is superseded by another case yeah, and then a precedent yeah. comes in, et cetera, sure. et cetera. A good example of that was the Pimlico Plumbers case, which reached the Supreme Court. Yeah. So obviously the decisions that were made on that were binding and they've encompassed a whole plethora of different things, in, including holiday pay and everything else. So you know, there's a lot to think about. And there's no section of any UK Act anywhere that says somebody's self-employed if they're doing X, Y, or Z, or employed if they're doing A, B, or C. So it's complicated. The off-payroll working rules, which were brought into the public sector in 2017, followed by the private sector ones in 2021, have made it even more complicated. So the ones that were removed completely and then brought back again as well. Yes, the yeah, twenty third of September will exactly. forever be burned in my mind. Twenty twenty two. Both as a working recruitment, it's a big area of what we deal with as well. It's like, oh, yeah. it's gone. Oh, it's back again. Okay, totally, totally. Yeah. And people were celebrating, and then they weren't celebrating. And oh my goodness me! And everything I wrote over a period of about three months was immediately rendered out of Redundant. date because yeah. you know, terrible. Anyway, so. Um, I guess, you know, there's tools and guidance out there to help you get it right. But, you know, fundamentally, every employer is on their own when it comes to making that final decision. Um, I had a, a, a meeting with HMRC yesterday, actually, about the CEST tool, the Check Employment yeah. Status for yeah. Tax tool. And we're just trying to make it a more even, you know, more user friendly, include more guidance in it, which uh, try to sort of explain to people that when they're using CEST, um, that isn't all there is to know. You have to look elsewhere for information before you can answer a question on the CES tool. So, you know, there's a lot of reading to be done and you kind of have to become a, a, a mini expert in it, which is impossible unless you do it every day. Well, but, I think you're, you're a mini expert on, on lots of things, I think, uh, just yeah, that has covered across. I know one thing I'm going to ask you, because I, I mentioned in my introduction, you're also on the construction forum with HMRC, BEIS. Yeah. I, mean, I haven't had anyone on the show yet, as far as I can recall, um, who's really been an expert on the CIS scheme, the construction industry scheme. Oh, right. um, yeah. So how does that relate to, to all of this? For those that are involved in those kind of payments, um, anything that we need to, to highlight on, on the CIS side of things? Yeah, I mean, it, you can't forget about the construction industry scheme. It's a, it's it's included in payroll returns, yeah, but it's not sort of payroll. It's like a weird hybrid of like a withholding tax mechanism for people yeah. who carry out construction operations as defined by HMRC. Um, HMRC says they can't be paid gross, even though they're technically self-employed. Those withholdings have got to be declared on an FPS, which employers prepare every month. And yes, of course, you guessed it, even more legislation underlying it. Um, guidance to be read and be abided by. It hasn't actually changed that much since it was introduced in the 1970s, which was when a load of um, Irish and, uh, you know, people from elsewhere, but predominantly Irish, actually, people came over from Ireland in uh, to work or in construction in the UK. And there was some sort of scheme put in place to try to, curb any kind of tax avoidance or you know, there, was a, there was a lot of mistrust in that whole sector and HMRC introduced this bizarre withholding scheme which we're still stuck with to this day um, oh. but actually nowadays most if you ask most subcontractors who are actually doing the work laying the bricks doing the the uh, pipe work and whatnot um, they actually say it's quite handy for them because the withholding of their income means that they have more or less accounted for it under a sure. weird form of pay as you earn by the end of the tax year. So there's very it's like little sensible for them to saving. Find. And, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, a lot of people I've worked with in the world of, of payroll recruitment, we tend to come across CIS payments within Bureau in particular, accountancy firms that will have construction, self employed construction workers and so on. But of course, a lot of people listening to this may have worked in payroll their whole career and, and never come across it because. It's, yeah. Unless you're dealing with construction workers, it's not going to come come across your desk. But yeah. certainly on the accountancy side, we see a lot of bureaus and accountancy firms involved in CIS payments. For sure. I mean, it's quite complicated for for you know in terms of what is and what isn't construction operations, and 
you know, what work is being done? Does that qualify for CIS deductions? Can you be paid gross? Can you be paid net? Whatever. Um, sometimes I, I swither because I do think that the, cons- the the contractors have got a good point in that, you know, if they're paying tax under a form of pay as you earn, CIS withholdings, then, you know, great. You know, it, it helps them pay their tax on time and, and they don't have to find as much money at the end of the mm. year. But I also think it's a bit nanny state of HMRC to do this when no other self-employed person in the UK has to do that. So, well, you know, I'm sure everybody be else... Yeah, I'm sure yeah. there's a few things that could probably be updated, right? Um, yeah. You mentioned salary sacrifice earlier. There's probably a few things that they could they could do to enhance it. But for someone listening yeah. to this, and they understand now the complexity that you've you brought to life brilliantly, I have to say. What does that mean for, for the UK, though? Because we know that for most departments within organisations, payroll is the most expensive department, and bringing in all those taxes must have a significant impact uh, on, on what the government's able to achieve. But what does that... Can you bring that to life for me? What do those numbers look like? Yes, absolutely. I mean, in terms of like pay as you earn and national insurance, um, they're the most important taxes in the UK. Without a shadow of a doubt, they bring in more money to HMRC's coffers than any other tax, which is about based on 2022 year to date figures alone. Um, and let's face it, we've not finished the tax year yeah. yet. Uh, it was about 500 billion. Wow. Um, okay. And yeah. It's actually more than double uh, that of the next biggest tax take, which is VAT. Um, and that's why I'm saying employment taxes rules the world, because it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel quite lucky, really, to be involved at policy level in such a mammoth, behemoth of an operation. And I I get trusted to, to, you know, I get to be like a trusted stakeholder to the UK and devolved governments on something that is basically an ever-changing topic. I think payrollers actually should feel proud of, of themselves that they are the Absolutely. key people. Yeah. They make, the, you know, it's an amazing success story. It's a success story by keeping the UK paid, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we've got 500, 500 billion. Wow. I mean, that, yeah. if that is a real shout out to the importance and the power of the payroll community. Uh, what a success story. Brilliant. Have you ever asked yourself... How can I recruit payroll staff effectively? Please don't give up on your recruitment project just yet. Here at JGA Payroll Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top payroll talent. We also understand just how costly a poor payroll hire can be. JGA Recruitment are a niche payroll recruitment agency who will partner with you to resource payroll candidates who will improve both the accuracy and efficiency of your payroll department. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Tell us a little bit about the, the origins then of PAYE, because if we're talking about significant sums. I don't know what was there as a as a, you know what the government did before PAYE was involved, and, and and I don't know if you know the answer to that either. But I, I think it was introduced in 1944. Has it stood the test of time? Does it need further evolution? What are your what are your thoughts on on the world of PAYE? Um, I suppose if I'm being cheeky, the answer is yes. Next subject. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously. Yes, it has stood the test of time, but let's think about this, right? So it's 1944. Let's cast our minds back to way before we were all born, even me. So it's almost 80 years ago. Second World War had not yet ended even. Um, A system of tax collection was desperately needed, really, to ensure that the UK, which was really suffering financially because of the war effort, could get back on its feet, receive rev- regular revenues to fund better services, such as the NHS, which was brought in round about the same time mm. in the 1940s. So, I mean, I believe essentially that the mechanism of pay as you earn and the legislation has stood the test of time. It's, it's generally well understood by employers and employees alike. In general, it still fulfills its original policy objective, which is to bring the money in. Um, Since it was brought online about a decade ago, it's even more streamlined than it was before, although um, there are a lot of hiccups. It's it's not a completely smooth process, as we all know. But 
there'll always be room for improvement on the administration and the software interface front. But yeah, I do. I think it stood the test of time and I can't see it being abandoned in favour of something better anytime soon, because as we know, it br- brings the money in. Sure, I'm absolutely right. Uh, I think you answered that really well, but I think one thing we've seen since the post-pandemic, right, is the rapid evolution of payroll tech, um, the evolution even of, of legislation. We think about things like furlough that was brought in in an instant and suddenly the whole world had to adapt. But it was uh, six, seven years ago that the, the Office um, of Tax uh, Simplification was asked to merge uh, tax and NIC back in 2015, but then they abandoned the idea. So where does that sit? You know, is it getting more complex? Is it getting more simple? What's What does the future hold? Yeah, well, oh, you know, the Office of Tax Simplification, bless them. Um, there's, it's, a, it's an interesting story. And unfortunately, it has rather a disappointing ending, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? Because I'm a bit biased, actually. I have to confess, um, I was on the team who worked on the um, a closer alignment of income tax and national insurance contributions projects times two, as it was then. Um, so there were two projects, which one ran straight after the other. One was to be finished in time for the 2016 spring statement, and the other was to be finished in time for the 2016 autumn statement because we, we worked directly for the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So the task was set by the two chancellors of that time, the first one being George Osborne and the second being Philip Hammond. And the task was to examine whether it was possible and feasible for income tax and national insurance contributions to be like closer aligned, yeah. uh, possibly even merged at some future point in, you know, to have more of a joined up approach for income tax and NICs law and practice because, you know, people get confused between if something's so, taxable, why isn't it enable? What, what does kind of thing. what does closer aligned mean in terms of well, simplification? Yeah, well, what what it actually means is things that are liable or not liable to income tax might be not be mirrored from a national insurance point of view. Okay. So, as I've mentioned already, that the legislation didn't. Um, sort of emerge from the same place. HMRC is responsible for tax, DWP for national insurance. That in itself makes it complex because the two, the two are sort of divided by a common language, if you like. Um, it leads to misunderstandings by employers and employees. Um, so what we did was we looked into all the areas of misalignment we found there were no less than 84 areas where wow. income okay. tax and NICs were misaligned. Um, this was across all the classes of national insurance. Uh, and we carried out some research, quali- qualitative research, quantitative research with many hundreds, actually, of stakeholders in that time. We were busy bees, um, <laughs> comprised employers, agents, rep bodies, individuals, a good old mixed bag of people were there with with little or no tax experience to those with tons. You know, we got a whole whole mixed bag of people. And then we produced our findings from that research in two separate reports. And the government agreed that a number of our recommendations could be accepted, which was good news. But they declined to do anything about aligning income tax and NICs fully or consider merging them into one simpler tax to be honest, I think it was just in the too complicated box at the time and also too politically unsavoury. Kind of ironic that it was too yeah. complicated to simplify the process. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, um, I did have a chat with somebody uh, fairly high up um, at uh, in, in one of the government departments and um, their, um, their take on it was you can't rebuild London And my take on it was when the fire of London happened, London was rebuilt. So if the will is there, you can rebuild London. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So So what what would have been the impact then if you had, in in your mind, if if these changes had gone through and we were, look, you know, we're having this podcast now, 2023, but post some of those changes, what what would the the, the world of payroll look like? How would that have impacted uh, the UK government or or, or the world of payroll? Well, I think... um, it would probably 
have simplified things to a very great extent across um, pay as you earn and all the classes of national insurance because things would have either been taxed and NI'd or not. You know, a decision would have been made in respect of mm. each of the elements. But actually, what we did in our reports was we es- we estimated that actually if if income tax and NI were fully aligned and possibly even merged, 7.1 million people would actually pay less national insurance overall, whereas right. 6.3 million would pay more national insurance. Not that much more, but a little bit more. Sure. And some of those who were paying more would also gain contributory benefits, which was a good thing in our, in our eyes anyway. So all in all, actually, the benefits would have outweighed the detriments and the revenues received would be substantially the same, but just be a little bit more fairly distributed. So it's a shame, really, I think, anyway, that they didn't decide to take it any further on a wholesale basis. Um, because for one thing, the employed pay more national insurance than the self-employed on the same level of earnings, which is yeah, not doesn't really seem fair. to make a lot of sense. So yeah. what, where do those reports sit now? I mean, is it is it too late for another government? I mean, had various... Uh, Changes in government in recent times, I thought it was quite interesting with the Liz Trust and Quasi Quarteng, who tried to simplify the process, and that went uh, went completely wrong. Um, but you know, those reports and those findings probably still ring true for for many areas that you that you analysed at the time. Is it too late for another government to come in and go? Actually, let's let's pick up where we left off. Let's let's implement some of these changes, or or, or you know, update it for what needs updating, and 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 still make these these implementations. Or do you think that that ship has sailed? No, I I think I don't think it's ever too late for a government to turn around and say, "Come on, let's do this. Let's give it a go." Um, even though there is the implication that you know, if you join income tax and NI together, that you've got one much bigger rate. So politically speaking, somebody's got to stand up in Parliament say and say, N- "People pay thirty odd percent in t- in tax." Um, which might sound unsavoury, but actually people are paying Already that anyway. Already paying it, yeah. So, you know, yeah, that's a marketing piece, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, you know, but actually it's never too late. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is that the Office of Tax Simplification has now been closed down. That was that was a Liz Truss and Quasi Quarteng measure that didn't get reversed out. And unfortunately, simplification um, has now been left to each department to carry out. Mm. And with under-resourcing issues and everything else, it's very unlikely that very much simplification will actually happen going forward. So it would have to be a special project. Yeah, it'd be hard to join the dots if you're all working in silos, right? So yeah. taking it back then to employment taxes, what are the main sticking points or, or thorny issues currently in, in your world? Well, there's there's lots of thorny issues, Nick, as you know, but <laughs> I, I suppose here, th- this is my top three that I can think of straight away. So first of all, national minimum wage sure. is probably the, the number one tricky thing out there at the moment. Especially um, right now, right, with everything going through on the consultations, everything else. It's, uh, yeah, 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 we're waiting absolutely. for. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, getting it wrong is easy because it's so complex. Um, some of the definitions which Bayes um, has created don't completely tally with definitions which are used for HMRC business. So yeah. I suppose a good example of that might be the treatment of like clothing and uniforms for NMW and for tax purposes. They're, they're different. Um, there's so many terms to learn, to understand, time, work time, salaried worker, unmeasured work, et cetera. How many employers actually know what any of those things mean? You know, um, getting it wrong means potentially huge bills for arrears of of pay yeah. and a penalty based on two hundred percent of the arrears. Getting wow. it wrong, it also means being named and shamed, which can destroy a business's reputation. You know, um, and the compliance investigations that HMRC undertakes can also take an awful long time to resolve too. Um, it uses up valuable employer resources, which they could use to generate more business and be more productive. So, I mean, obviously, it's right to protect vulnerable employees from unscrupulous employers. That goes without saying. But the vast majority of the compliance work that's undertaken by HMRC is around people who've made innocent mistakes. 
um, not yeah. by trying to exploit people, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because I mean, I host payroll question time and um, on a monthly basis. And by far the most common questions that we get in from payroll professionals, which obviously predominantly join the show, are related to national minimum wage, national living wage, and how the, you know, the confusion there, and holiday pay. And it's yeah. um, particularly with the consultations going through on holiday pay at the moment and, and the changes they're going through. So it's, you know, this is something you would think would would, would have nailed by now, right? And people have an understanding, but it's it's just so complex and ever changing and evolving that, um, yeah, it makes me makes me happy that I'm on the recruitment side of the world of payroll rather than the processing calculation side because I think I would I don't have the the numerate skills I think to be able to manage some of this. So you know, kudos to those that do. Oh, um, too right, yeah. And you mentioned animal minimum wage right at the start of this of the show. We also talked a lot about hybrid working. Mm. Would that form one of the? Yes, it's, that... it's in my top three uh, at the moment because um, hybrid working arrangements are currently causing lots of headaches for employers. You know, not just because of the people management aspects, which are too many to mention here, sadly, but also because of the tax implications of working from home traveling into work on certain days, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the tax side is rather entrenched and a little bit old fashioned, probably some reform needed there. Um, in policy, we're working with HMRC to see if there's a better way of looking at that. Bearing in mind, you know, some aspects of the tax legislation don't lend themselves easily to mm. the government's net zero targets, for example. Um, like you can get tax relief, as we know, for getting a bike in a bike to work scheme. But why shouldn't you get tax relief for buying a bike through your employer full stop? Surely it's better. Yeah, to, makes sense. For, it's better for the environment. It's better for public health to ride a bicycle than it is to ride in a car, surely. So things like that need to be looked at in a different way, I think, because of the environmental considerations. Sure. Some of it just needs a little bit more joined up thinking, doesn't it? Yeah. That's, that's what it sounds like. And what's your what's your third key point? My, my big th- third one is employment status, which I mentioned earlier, you did including indeed, yeah. off payroll arrangements, because it's a perennial pain um, for employers to navigate. It's full of shark infested dangers lurking for the for the unwary. It's really not easy to become an expert on employment status. And as we know, it's based on case law rather than legislation and guidance. So if it changes and certain aspects become more or less important as the judiciary places different emphasis on things, you know, that there's different emphasis to consider at different times as case law evolves. And I suppose my six main things that every employer should consider would be, you know, number one, look at the facts, not what the parties want it to be. You know, yeah. if somebody somebody wants to be self-employed, but they might actually not be self-employed. I'm gonna make I've got to make some role. notes here so the listeners can can think <laughs> yeah. about this and then and make then, some you know, notes. Yeah, and then reply and uh, uh, or rather rewind and, and get these six points. So Absolutely. six main things I think you said that every employer should consider. First one, six I've just made a note. Things. Look at the facts, not what the parties want. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So Justine's big six. Number one, go. look at the facts, not what the parties want it to be. Ask if they find out if there is mutuality of obligation. That is a really difficult concept to get your head round. So wrap a cold towel around your head. <laughs> and read up on mutuality of obligation because essentially there cannot be a contract of employment unless there is mutuality of obligation. It's a complex legal uh, concept, but it is possible to understand it. And essentially what it means is that the employer has an obligation to provide work and the employee has an obligation to do it. So that is a sort of, you're establishing that there's a some, some sort of master-servant relationship going on there. Um if the employer is not obliged to provide work and the employee isn't actually, empl- you know, the, the individual, as I, as I should have said, isn't obliged to do it, then there's probably a case of self-employment going on there because the individual's got a choice. Um, so the other, the, the next thing to think about is, is the worker required to provide a personal service? So is it them that the, that the engager wants? Do they want that specific person with those specific skills to carry out that specific task? So that's the that's the next one to think about. And 
then we need to look at how much control is exerted over the worker by the engager. So if there's a significant amount of control and their activities are being curtailed or they, they can't just get up one morning and decide, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to wear this, I'm going to wear that, I'm going to use that equipment instead of that equipment, you know. Um, a good tax case to look at for that is the one about um, Eamon Holmes, the the IT, the IT TV presenter. There's a fantastic case on that where he thought he had total control over what he did and he didn't. So that, that that's a really good case uh, to look at. And I'll send you a link for that later on because um, I wrote an article about it. And um, the next thing to to look at is does the worker actually use all their own equipment? You can have somebody who brings along a great big massive toolbox to do their work and they won't use anybody else's tools and it's their tools and they're a skilled craftsman and that's what they use, et cetera. You might have um, a guy that decides he's a, he's a, a, a sort of an expert on cheese and the only thing that he has in his equipment box is a cheese sort of scraper outer if you like and he sticks it in a in a cheese brings it out and decides whether it's a, a good cheese or not because of his special nose and his technique and that person is more independent because he's using his own tools and his own specialist judgment so you know there's all sorts of different people doing different jobs but do they use all their own equipment and can they use a substitute to, to do the job and the CES tool, as I said to them to HMRC yesterday, is rubbish on this particular section. It needs improving because the language is a bit confusing. If you can say to somebody, um, I'm not coming next week because I'm going to Rio on holiday and I'm I'm sending Gladys instead, who is just as capable of me as doing this of doing this job, I'll be paying Gladys. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's it sort of thing. Uh, or the contract includes me and Gladys's time and one of us will turn up and do the job and you just pay the bill at the end and the engager accepts that, then there's a much greater degree of independence by the individual. So that's my top six. If Fantastic. you look at those, you know, hopefully... It'll help. So I need to put down my uh, copy of Captain Credit's Mandolin. I need to read up on the mutuality of, <laughs> of obligation. There's my summertime reading coming up. So I'm just going to run through those again as I wrote them down. We've got six main things every employer should consider. Number one was look at the facts, not what the parties want. Number two, is there mutuality of obligation? Go and research what that means if we're not familiar. Uh, number three, is the worker required to provide a personal service? And number four, is there significant control over the worker by the engager? And there's a great case we can read up further about regarding aim and homes on that uh, number five does the worker use all their own equipment and number six can the worker use a substitute to do the job does all of this sit within the responsibility of the the head of payroll the payroll manager to do some of these assessments or does this sit within hr is this a mutual combined joined up approach to understanding you know? yeah i mean i would like to see it as a joined up approach because i think that what you really can't do is let that particular plate that you're spinning drop. Somebody yeah. needs to remember to make sure that these questions get answered before you engage somebody. So before they go on the payroll, before they give you that P45 or fill in a starter form or whatever, before any of that happens, you need to decide whether somebody's employed or self-employed. And a lot of, you hear a lot of HR professionals sometimes say, I'm not concerned with self-employed people. I only deal with employees. But actually somebody somewhere has to, whether that's procurement, whether it's the, you know, the finance director, whether it's the HR person, whether it's payroll manager, somebody somewhere in that chain has to go through those questions and make that decision. Yeah, certainly in my experience, uh, particularly on PQT per question time, there hasn't really been any real clarity from the guts and from the government. I'm not saying it's their responsibility to tell them, but where the IR35 uh, in particular sort of assessment sits, you know, who yeah. takes responsibility. And sometimes then no one takes responsibility and then you end up in in in, in hot water. So I do yeah. think, you know, depending on where you are in your business, this is something that... Uh, probably needs to be understood so people know what they're doing when it when it comes through. And using those six points is a great reference point. 
So with everything can considered, I, sorry, go can on. Can I just course. say one more thing before Absolutely. I forget on that? I've come across lots and lots of situations in big organisations where, uh, for example, somebody recruits somebody that they know. So they'll say, oh, you know, let's say you've got a university. They know this great professor or this great, you know, teacher of, of people. And they say, They'll, they'd be magnificent at delivering that particular course. I'm going to ask them if they want a job. So they basically recruit one of their mates and, um, you know, all that all that kind of uh, stuff aside, um, the, the issue is not whether they're recruiting one of their mates or whether they're, they're recruiting their daughter or, or whatever. Um, the issue is whether is that person employed or self-employed and if if somebody gets brought in because of somebody that they know these issues often get forgotten about and it's natural to recruit people that you know or that you've heard of or that you respect or whatever but don't forget about that main nub issue yeah that makes sense a really good point to, to raise at the end as well and so Everything considered, lots of information to take away here and really, really in-depth uh, conversation about uh, employment taxes and payroll. What does the future then hold for, for payroll and employment taxes? How do you see the, the the future of the industry evolving? As we've said before, all of this is an, a huge earner for the exchequer. It's a huge industry from payroll to tax consulting, off payroll working, agencies, umbrella companies and beyond. So. While ever there is employment, there will be employment taxation and law and payroll. There is, however, a need for simplification and streamlining. That should ideally be done by way of annual maintenance by the government to stop it from getting too unwieldy, you know. Um, unfortunately, as we've said, Office of Tax Simplification was decommissioned in the autumn of last year. Um, it'll be for... HMRC and other departments to simplify as they go, which seems unlikely, as I've said, given resource constraints. So, but I don't, I think the future's bright for employment taxes. I think the future's bright for payroll. And I think what we need to do as professionals in those industries is to be as proactive and agile as we possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. But how about from a strategic point of view? Do you see that post-pandemic in particular, we've seen a lot of uh, quick changes in the world of technology, the world of data. Um, you know, we've seen legislation advance as well. Do you see the role of payroll, uh, the role of payroll fashion becoming more strategic? Do you see more directors having a seat at the table? Are we still too far away from that? What's your view on the strategic side of, of, of the evolution of the world of payroll? I, I really hope so. I really, really hope so. I I would like to see this podcast landing on every managing director's desk, every CEO's desk to make people understand how complicated it is and what the issues are that need to be considered around this. Because especially as well, if you're a large business, you've got senior accounting officer responsibilities. There's all sorts of different corporate offences that you can commit for getting things wrong and for getting your taxes wrong, etc. And bearing in mind, we're dealing with the biggest taxes in the UK here. It's absolutely vital that people take this seriously for once in their lives, get on the, you know, get payroll round the boardroom table, let everybody round that boardroom table understand what's going on with payroll and why it could destroy their business if it's not done properly. Wow, you heard it here brilliantly. As I'm giving you a virtual high five across the airways for that, Justine. Fantastic. And it was a good shout out for the show as well. I didn't get a chance at the start because the introduction with everything that you're involved in, I didn't think gave us time to do it. But maybe that's the shout out we need. So if you're listening to this now, go and share it with your, with your, with your board. Go and share it with your MD. Go and share it with the, the COO. And um, yeah, let's, um, let's again continue to raise the profile and the importance of payroll because as you know, it collects over 500 billion, I think we mentioned earlier. Um, for the government and it's uh, an incredibly important function um, and I think you've you've brought that to life fantastically well for our payroll podcast listeners thank you so much for doing that so we're going to quickly open the, the payroll vault um, three short sharp questions for you Justine a bit of fun really but what one piece of advice you would give to someone working in the world of payroll right now stick with it don't give up 
Uh, number two, if you had the power of foresight and you could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement, and I may have even touched upon this in the show, but I'll I'll wait and see what your answer might be. But what would that action or improvement be? If I could improve the world of payroll in one action, it would be to um, update HMRC's side of real-time information so that the debt management and banking process and the l p reader and everything else to do with submitting returns to HMRC were actually up to date on the HMRC side. Wow, great. I, mean, I thought it might be something along the lines of uh, of simplification. I think we're almost there. I've got to say a quick apology. I've got some construction work outside. I can hear I've just muted myself a couple of times. I don't know if that's coming through. Uh, I hope if you are they're getting doing random... CIS deductions then, Nick. Well, you're yeah, absolutely so, right. So... Yes. If you're hearing bangs and noises, apologies. I've t- tried to try to mute it as much as I can. Uh, last question, um, bit of fun for you. If Pale was a song or a movie, what song or movie would it be and why? Oh my goodness me. Oh, if it was a movie or a song. It'd have to be. I was. I, I can't say "Dancing in the Dark" because that's far too sarcastic and and not very complimentary. So I'm not going to say that Bruce Springsteen one. Oh, well, I'm a huge think... Boss fan, so I wouldn't have minded. Like my, I've got. I've got. I've literally got a, a, a things on my wall in front of which you can't see, which has lyrics of him on my. He's my idol. Bruce Springsteen is like my favorite musician of all times. So I wouldn't have minded, but I mean, honestly, um, I thought the the payroll song at the CIPP conference was fantastic, but I think I might have to go with, and and this is not sexist because for girls you. Can can substitute boys but i would say girls just want to have fun yeah well that's a i think that's a great way to end the show and you gave the payroll song a shout out which was uh, produced by myself so i'll take that my <laughs> payroll career i'll put a link in the show notes it was for those excellent that haven't heard it it's called my payroll career and you can get it on itunes and amazon and everywhere else but it's just a bit of fun and every download every every penny that streamy makes goes towards charity as well so do check out that song if you get a moment justine it's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure having you today on the payroll podcast i think everyone is in you know immersed in the world of payroll in whatever way it might be, whether you're in HR, whether you're in employment taxes, whether you're an MD or COO, it's got something to take away from this episode. So thank you so much. It's been really powerful. Um, it's 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 really encouraged some thought in me. And I don't even I don't even process payroll, right? But it's got my mind whirring. So thank you so much for doing that. And of course, if you're a payroll leader listening to this show um, and you're not getting um, uh, diverted by the construction noise in the background here, which hopefully isn't coming through, uh, but you need support with a payroll related vacancy, then please do give myself or any of my wonderful team here a call at JJ Recruitment. You can access us at www.jgarecruitment.com or contact me directly, nick at jjrecruitment.com as well. And all those links will be in the show notes. I will also put a link to the icon ICAS uh, website for those that want to find out more about ICAS in the show notes and a link to uh, Justine's LinkedIn page as well. So if you want to reach out to Justine uh, and connect, then you have the ability to do so. So uh, Justine, huge thank you. I've I've loved every minute of it. It's been a, been a real too. privilege. So thank you. That's all for this episode of the Payroll Podcast. I hope you enjoyed our discussion today and gained valuable insights and inspiration to advance your payroll career or your payroll operation. If you haven't already, please, please do subscribe to the show so you never miss a future episode. And if you found this podcast helpful, please take a moment to leave us a little review on your preferred podcast platform. It's your feedback that really helps me to improve the show and, of course, attract new listeners so we can continue to raise the profile of the payroll industry for all. Finally, if you know anyone who could benefit from this payroll podcast, please do share it with them. Let's spread the word and build a vibrant community of payroll professionals worldwide. Thank you, of course, for listening. My name is Nick Day. Please do look me up on LinkedIn and send me a connection request. In the meantime, I look forward to being with you again on the next episode of the Payroll Podcast real soon.